in middle America, at the joining of North and South America, lies the modern Republic of Guatemala. 2,000 years ago, the culture of the Maya rose from the jungle. This is the story of Tikal, their largest city. And this is also the story of the archaeologists who dig into the jungle floor to uncover the remains of a civilization. The population of the Maya virtually disappeared a thousand years ago. The temples and palaces of Tikal were swallowed by the jungle. Until the middle of the last century, they were unknown to the European world. Then, three times around the turn of the century, archaeologists visited Tikal. Each time the jungle was cleared, and each time the jungle returned. Finally, in 1956, the University of Pennsylvania began to excavate. The heart of Tikal was at Plaza. One causeway led west to Temple 4. Another continued on to the northern group of temples, and a third joined the northern group to the central plaza. Most of the digging has been in the temple complex lying around the plaza. East and on the west rise two temples. To the north is the North Acropolis, and to the south is the Central Acropolis. In the Central Acropolis, the jungle still stands. The roots of trees and vines gradually pry apart the stone masonry. The only archaeology is done by the larger trees which fall in storms, ripping open walls with their roots. A few palaces in the central Acropolis are high enough to break free of the jungle. The only permanent inhabitants are timid porcupines. Most of the buildings are only suggestive lumps hidden under the carpet of a jungle floor. Temple 2, on the west side of the main plaza, has finally been freed from the jungle. It is typical of Maya pyramid temples, the steep stepped sides rising 60 feet to support a small temple with narrow rooms. On top of this stands the false front of the roof comb, 100 feet above the plaza. Along the left side of the plaza stand two rows of stelae, the stone monuments erected by the Maya, usually to commemorate not persons or events, but simply dates in their calendar. Since the dates in the Maya calendar can now be translated into dates in the Christian calendar, the stelae are important in telling just when a particular plaza floor or temple was constructed. Most of the stelae have been badly damaged by the weather in the jungle. Now it is necessary to protect them from further destruction. Behind the rows of stelae stands the broad platform called the North Acropolis. Through the centuries, the Maya enlarged it level by level. The last temples they built are on top, but deep within the Acropolis lie buried the remains of much earlier structures. In the spring of 1960, a tunnel was dug through one of the later structures. In the fill, a stela was found. The carving was still fresh, and the date could be read with ease. Beside each glyph or symbol was a number written using a bar for five, a dot for one. Each small glyph is a part of one of the many cycles which the Maya combined into a single complex system. Some of the cycles are purely artificial. Others are based on the sun, the moon, or Venus. According to the Maya philosophy, each day and each number was a god with influences for good or evil. Since combinations of gods recurred, it was important to know when propitious or unpropitious days would fall and this could be predicted only if one kept close track of all the cycles. The figure on the front of the stela was a man, perhaps a priest, in full regalia. The body was portrayed from the front, with the face turned to the left. In the crook of his left arm, he holds a severed human head, while his right arm is clenched into a fist. 
Around his waist is a braided belt with a mask in profile at either side. The left wrist is heavy with jade ornaments, and around his neck are still more. Probably the stealer once stood before a temple, but was then removed and finally buried inside a later pyramid. Perhaps as a symbolic gesture to destroy its power, its face was smashed. Above the face, sweeping up and to the right, is the headdress, intricately carved. In the folds of the headdress are small masks. One faces downwards with a grotesque protrusion of the upper jaw. And an owl stands in the gaping mouth of a serpent. Stela 31 is important because it has been so well preserved. But another Stela, Stela 29, is even more important. It was found quite by accident in a clearing just beyond the main plaza. Although it has been badly weathered, one can still read the bars and dots which give a date of 8, 12, 14, 8, 15 in the Maya system. It is now the earliest date known from anywhere in the Maya region and probably refers to a day in the year 292 AD. Now it is possible to say that by this time the Maya had already developed much of their calendar system. But of course tomorrow or the next day another Maya inscription may be found pushing the date back even further. The temples on the North Acropolis must first be cleared of jungle. Then the rooms are empty. Often the wooden lintels supporting the roof have broken, filling the interiors with tons of limestone blocks. Also earth blown in by the wind or formed by rotting vegetation must be removed. The original plaster of the floors and walls is exposed. On the walls are found crude designs called graffiti. They depict Maya people or temples. Their significance is unknown. Perhaps they are no more than the casual sketches of Maya priests. Temple One to the east of the Great Plaza is being restored. A steel scaffolding has been erected on the roof comb above the temple, and work under the direction of a trained architect progresses. The fineness of the stone mosaic is remarkable since it could never have been seen from the ground 100 feet below. Once the roof comb gleamed white across the treetops, but a thousand years of slow decay have wrought serious damage. Now it is necessary to preserve this monument. Each limestone block is taken out, cleaned and re-cemented. Those too rotten are replaced. The purpose is not to restore the temple to its original form, but to stabilize it and protect it from further damage. Beyond Temple One lies one of the many groups of small temples and palaces called Twin Pyramid Complexes. Two low stepped pyramids face each other across a small plaza. To the north stands a wall enclosing a single stela and its altar, and closing the square on the south is always a long palace. The palace of group E is called the Nine Entrance Palace. Only the bases of the walls remain, but these are being restored. The remains have been cleared and carefully studied. Damaged blocks will be replaced, but here again no attempt at complete reconstruction will be made. Freshly quarried limestone is soft and easily cut by the modern steel axes. But the Maya had no metal, only crude axes chipped from the native flint. Cement is made in the same manner the Maya made it. Lime from burned limestone, earth, and water.
In the jungles around the temples and palaces lie thousands of small mounds, the remains of small temples and dwelling places. One cluster of these mounds was excavated in the summers of 1959 and 1960. Beside the houses of the modern Maya workmen lie the ruins, perhaps, of the houses of the ancient Maya. A thin layer of earth has collected over the ruin, but even in the jungle, the low mound is obvious to a trained archaeologist. The jungle, which was pushed back briefly while the Maya lived here, is pushed back once or more with the efficient machete. The ground is broken and with picks and shovels the archaeologists cut through a thousand years into the world of the prehistoric Maya. The earth is full of ancient trash pottery, stone tools, and sometimes even jade. Later it will all be analyzed, but the first step is careful excavation. The workman digs by 20 centimeter levels, measuring as he goes. Gradually more area is opened. The remains of crude stone walls and plaster floors are revealed. Tree roots have destroyed much, but the outlines of a platform are easily detected. A house may once have stood here, raised above the ground. Beside one of the platforms, a hole was found which had been dug into the solid bedrock. Such holes, called chultuns, are common in the Maya area. The purpose of chultuns is still debated by archaeologists. Perhaps they were storage pits, or small reservoirs, or quarries for soft marl. This one was a grave, for at the bottom is found a burial, a few scraps of human bones, and five clay vessels. Maps are drawn, photographs are taken, and then the vessels are carefully removed. Around the main plaza, everything is on a grander scale. In the tombs are found jades and corals and ocean shells, incised obsidians and fine mosaics, all indicating an important priest or ruler. But outside the temple area, the burials of lesser men are found in chultuns and under the plaster floors of the house platforms. There are no ornaments, only a few pots. But these pots are important to the archaeologist. They help to tie the house mounds to the temples. But burials and pots are rare. Day after day, the work is routine and hot. The men go into the jungle to cut palm fronds for sunshades. Many of the men are fine diggers. Even without grasping the niceties of the ancient calendar, they do understand that a high culture once lived and built at Tikal. They are not trained to make an analysis of pottery, yet they can find and follow the fragmented plaster floors with rare patience and skill. The men live at Tikal with their families, and plant their maize where gradually new trash heaps accumulate. Most of the men come from Guatemala and many from the jungle lowlands. 
These are the real descendants of the ancient Maya and speak both Maya and Spanish. A few men come from near Belize in British Honduras and speak English. Others are Highland Maya from the mountains to the south. Summer is a bad time to work at Tikal. Sudden rain squalls come out of the east. They pass quickly, leaving fallen trees across the trenches. and the deeper trenches are filled with water. Until the sun comes out again and work resumes. By the side of a platform, another burial is found. First the whole pot, which is a warning that a burial is near, and then the human bones. Shovels and picks have long since been discarded. Now the paintbrush and the dental tools are used. And after hours of careful work, the fragile bones are exposed. The burial is in a typical position, lying on its right side, facing the west with its head towards the north. The legs are partially flexed. The skull lies on an upturned vessel with a hole punched in its bottom. Archaeologists say the pot is ceremonially killed so that its soul will go with the soul of the dead man. The burial is recorded. The brittle bones are painted with a hardening solution and carefully removed. The most common finds of all are the lowly potsherds, broken pieces of pottery. In this part of Tikal, where no stelae stand, potsherds are indispensable for the archaeologist. They are ideal for dating purposes, since styles of pottery change fairly rapidly. Pots of baked clay break easily, and once broken, are worthless to their owners. But the trash heaps of prehistoric peoples are the reference libraries of the archaeologist. And so each shirt is washed, set out to dry, and eventually taken to a laboratory to be studied. From the pot sherds and the stone tools and all the other artifacts, a picture forms of the people who once inhabited Tikal. At a thousand years remove, one must be careful to say probably, possibly, apparently, it seems that, but recognizing these limitations, archaeology is done within them. From these mounds and from other mounds hidden in the jungles of Tikal, one begins to learn what the Maya were doing when they were not building temples. They are long dead, of course, but through their art a fleeting glimpse can still be caught of the men and women who lived in those times. Dozens of small clay figurines are found around the house mounds and the temples. Some were pressed in a mold and others carefully modeled by hand. There were no two identical, even among the mold-made figurines. They are like miniature portraits, showing variations in dress and hairdo and facial expression. Some types are complete, while others are represented only by heads. Perhaps they were used in religious ceremonies. Perhaps they were souvenirs brought to Tikal by pilgrims or traders, returning from nearby temple sites like Washaktun. Many are hollow whistles and may have been merely toys for children. Today in the marketplaces of Guatemala City, 
One can buy whistles like this one, made by modern craftsmen, unaware that they are continuing an old tradition. One figurine lacks head and arms, but between the gaunt ribs and the protruding stomach, a deep cut indicates a human sacrifice whose heart has been removed. And scratched into the plaster of the temple walls are more pictures of the Maya. Casual, almost comic. One graffiti shows a ceremony. A figure on the right shoots an arrow into the figure in the center tied to a wooden frame, while the figure on the left merely looks on. On a tiny stealer made of clay stands a man in profile, facing left and holding a spear in front of him. A jade pendant bears another figure. And a human face is made in fine mosaic. The builders of Tikal are silent, but the civilization they created, the heritage of their descendants, is an achievement for all to admire. Most of their works still lie beneath the Guatemalan jungle. It will take years of effort to unravel the secrets of Tikal alone, and there are still hundreds of Maya sites which have hardly been touched. But gradually the inquiring shovels of the archaeologists are bringing light to the prehistoric world of the Maya.